All right. Good morning, Antioch Church. It's so great to see you all. Uh, be, all these brave people who came out with the threat of snow, and you still came into the house of God. Amen. 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 It's so good to worship the Lord this morning. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in online. Thank you all for joining us on Facebook. Who's ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Woo! All right. We got a few announcements. We're going to run through the slides here. I'm guessing now. I haven't actually looked at these yet, but I am I'm confident. I have looked at these. We want to celebrate two new greeters that signed up during I Love My Church Month. Thank you so much. And there's always room for at least one more member on the team. So if you have a bright smile and you like greeting people, you don't know you're the kind you're the kind of person who's never met a stranger, this is the ministry spot for you. So thank you to the two that signed up. We collected 205 hope boxes. Praise God. And those are going out at the end of this month. Thank you to everyone who, who went out and bought and prayed over those boxes. We're so excited for this mission's opportunity to take those boxes and to deliver the hope of Jesus Christ to those students in Kentucky. That trip is happening at the end of the month. So be praying for our team of eight that's going out. Their names are in your bulletin. So you can pull your bulletin out. Always a good idea to read that thing. Lots of good information. Pray over that missions team and thank you again for helping us deliver hope. Amen. All right, up next, we are still collecting Easter eggs and candy. Isn't it great to see the, man, it is stacking up over there. We've got tons of eggs. Thank you to everyone who's brought them. Thank you to those who have stuffed them. And a special thank you to those who have already taped them and wrapped them. Man, you're going above and beyond Antioch as you always do. Thank you so much for those donations. And we're still collecting those, so keep bringing them in every single week. All right, next slide. Tonight, we are having Awana, we are having Awakening Youth, and we are having a team small group. All that is happening tonight from 5.30 to 7, so come on out and join us. All right, what's next? 
Ladies, we've got lots of Bible study opportunities for you. Make sure that you check us out on Thursdays, either at 10 o'clock in this building or at 6.30 p.m. over in the chapel. And you can see the studies that we're uh, looking at there. Great opportunities for fellowship. Amen. I'm going to keep on rolling. Make sure you follow us on social media. If you have a smartphone, you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you. If you scan the QR code on your left, if you're a visitor and you don't want to meet a whole lot of people, you just want to be kind of low key and let us know that you are here, you can scan that code and fill out the visitor's form online. Isn't technology great? And then Pastor DJ or I will be in touch with you next week to thank you for coming. If you like a more personal approach than just come into the kitchen at the end of service for coffee, cookies, and connect, we'll share a cup of coffee and we'll tell you more about the church, get to know each other, and uh, start fellowshipping together in the Lord. Amen. I think that's it. And I think that's record timing. Amen. Let's get up on our feet. Gave you the quick sale this morning. Short version. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts and lives. We thank you for giving us the breath that we're breathing this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name and worship you. Lord, we just pray that you'll receive our praises, that you will be exalted and lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. Our God is the lion and the lamb, and we get to worship him. We get to praise him. And we also get to sing songs that we know that are familiar to us about all of the things that he's doing. So we're going to sing an old one this morning. It says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. No. 
tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. chapter 20 we're picking up in verse 45 if you've missed the middle section pastor DJ did an awesome job on Wednesday night you can go back and watch the recording we're picking up in our series from the temple to the tomb the last week in the life of Jesus and so we're going to read from Luke chapter 20 verse 45 through chapter 21 and verse 6 Hear the word of the Lord. It says, while the people were listening, he said to his disciples, thank you. That's not what Jesus said. I'm saying that. Let's start over. Okay. Verse, a lot of people get their words and Jesus' words confused. Amen. All right. I ain't going to preach on that right now, but we'll just, that was free. Okay. While the people were listening, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who want to go around in long robes and who love greetings in the marketplaces, the front seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. These will receive greater judgment. And he looked up and he saw the rich dropping their offerings into the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow dropping in two tiny coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all these people have put in gifts out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty has put in all she had to live on. And as some were talking about the temple complex, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. He said, these things that you see The days will come when not one stone will be left on another that will not be thrown down. Heavenly Father, we just pray we will hear your warning this morning. I pray, O God, that we will hear the still small voice of your Holy Spirit calling out to our hearts as deep cries out to deep, Lord. Help us to know and realize, God, you don't want the show. You don't want the display. You just don't want frivolous gifts dedicated in public Lord you want private devotion you want the secret place of our lives to be a sacred place to you Lord you want our whole heart and you will receive and you will accept nothing less so Lord help us oh God those of us who have gotten so good at the show help us oh God those of us who love the places of prominence 
Those of us who love to pray long prayers just to be heard by men. Help us to remember that it is the Father who sees what is done in secret that rewards. So Lord, help us to guard our hearts. Lord, help us to give our all. And this morning, help us to get it right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Last week we saw Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He rode in on a donkey, an animal of peace, a beast of burden. And we saw him not go to the Capitol building. He went to the temple to clean house. He went to the temple to drive out the money changers and the corrupt. And we saw Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because they had missed their time of visitation. They were celebrating and honoring him as king, but they had totally missed the real freedom that he had come to give them and to bring them, and they missed their time of visitation. After Jesus cleans out the temple, he spends the next few days of his last week in his earthly ministry in all of chapter 20 and 21, teaching, and while he is teaching, the religious leaders, instead of learning from him, they are plotting and planning how they can kill him. Now, Jesus had already told the 12 disciples that they should expect conflict and suffering when they arrived in the holy city. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, all the way back to chapter 9, verse 22, he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be slain and raised on the third day. He told them pointedly exactly what was going to happen, and yet it still took them by surprise. Many times in our lives, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are trying to give us a glimpse, and they're trying to tell us exactly what we should expect, exactly where we should go, and yet sometimes we are still surprised by what God actually does. It's because many of us do exactly what the Bible says. Hearing, we don't hear, and seeing, we don't see. Our hearts are clouded. Our hearts are hardened by what Jesus referred to as the cares and worries of this life. In chapter 20, we see and we meet these three religious groups. We meet the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. And we witness their conflict with Jesus. They challenged him because he had cleansed the temple and he called them thieves. Right? You want to fight somebody when they make an accusation. Right? You calling me a liar? Well, uh, right? They stepped up to that challenge, and they were trying to, to listen to him and catch him in his words. They were trying to trump up charges so that they could arrest him and have, and have him arrested as an enemy of the state. But there was more to those series of questions than, than just that. The, the, word trans, the word translated rejected in Luke, 20, in Luke 9, 22, and also in Luke 20, 17, means to reject after investigation. What you may not know about the Passover lamb, which is what the Jews were preparing to celebrate, was that from the 10th day to the 14th day, the priests had to make sure that the Passover lamb had no blemishes. The lamb had to be investigated. And that's exactly what happens during Jesus' last week on earth. He was being examined and tested. And even though they could not stop him, they could not find anything to charge him on, they still rejected him in their heart. And Jesus was also examining them. Don't you know, anytime Jesus asks a question, it's not because he doesn't already know the answer. It's because he's trying to teach us something about ourselves. Many times, something about ourselves that either we are purposefully ignoring or that we are totally oblivious to. They questioned Jesus about John the Baptist. They were really questioning his authority. Jesus told a parable to illustrate his rejection by the Jewish people. They questioned him about paying taxes to Caesar. And yes, unfortunately, Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God's what is God's. So you got to pay your taxes. All right. Jesus paid his tax. Now, Jesus would just catch a fish and pull the money out the fish's mouth. I haven't mastered that yet, but it ain't from lack of try. Doing a lot of fishing, but there ain't nobody in the fish I catch. That's got to be a, a Jesus-only thing. They, and then they question him again about the resurrection. Jesus turns the tables, and he asks a question about Psalm 110 when he says, who is David talking to in Psalm 110 when he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. What Jesus was trying to tell them again was that he was the son of David, the promised Messiah, the chosen one, and they still couldn't see it. We're picking up here at the end of chapter 20. And the sad thing is, is that in all their questioning of Jesus, they really are rejecting the true and only answer that will satisfy the soul, the questions of the soul. Our soul has questions. 
And I'm here to tell us this morning, Jesus is the answer. But so often, instead of submitting to Jesus as Lord, we continually question His authority in our lives. And we continually try to find loopholes and try to find ways where we can still do what we want to do and appease our conscience. We want to follow our will, not His will. There is a warning at the end of chapter 20 for us, and that warning I summed it up in three words is we got to guard our hearts. I said it at the end of second service. I don't think I mentioned it in the first service last week, but there is a little Pharisee hidden in all of us. There is a little Pharisee hidden in all of us, some, somewhere deep down inside of all us beautiful religious people that says, well, if I can do just enough to please God, then I can still have my cake and eat it too. There is a tendency for all of us just to try and look the part on Sunday. We have all followed, fallen into that trap, but we're just keeping up appearances, right? We're here, but really and truly inside. We're smiling on the outside, but really on the inside, we're a wreck. We're a mess. We need to remember, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He examines the heart. Scripture says he weighs and tests the heart, and he knows the heart. God looks at the heart. And Jesus is warning the people. He's saying, beware of these scribes. And you've got to remember, these scribes, they were experts in the law. It was their job to write and record and translate and transcribe the written law of God. And all that time, the Holy Spirit was wanting to write it on their hearts, and they were totally shutting him out. Jesus had answered their questions. Jesus beat them at their own game. And because they couldn't outsmart him, they just decided to lie and wait for an opportunity to kill him. And Jesus said, listen, look out for these types of people. Look out for those people who will smile to your face. And as soon as you turn around, they will stab you in your back. And isn't it sad that he's talking about religion? He ain't talking about heathens. He's saying, beware of the professional religious people. The people that the people looked to, they paid, they trusted in. They got their salary from the temple taxes. Many times, instead of repenting and turning to Jesus, we harden our hearts just like they did. Many times we can become so blinded by our own ambitions and so bent on achieving what we desire in the moment that we push Jesus aside and turn away from the very one that can satisfy the longing of our hearts. The, cri the scribes could not see their wickedness because they had gotten so good at looking righteous. And some of you sitting in this Baptist church, you have gotten so good at looking like a Christian. You have gotten so good at looking like you've got it all together. You have gotten so good. You know the church talk, but you don't have that Jesus walk. We're so concerned about looking good in front of people. Many times we fail to see how wretched we look before God. And that's what the scribes had done. They were obsessed with the outward perception of others and they could care less about the God who examines the hearts. These were the people who were devoted to preserving and copying the scriptures. They looked at the Bible, at the Old Testament more than anyone else. It was their life, their livelihood. And they still rejected the Messiah. They were masters in the law of Moses and couldn't see the master of the universe. Not he, man, Jesus. They couldn't see the master of the universe. I couldn't help myself. They couldn't see the master standing right in front of them. I'm here to remind us, having biblical knowledge is not enough. Knowing what to say, you may even know where to find it. But having it up here is not enough. Is it here and is your heart surrendered to Jesus? Like that old expression says, if you have, it, if you have the word of God in your head but not in your heart, you miss heaven by a foot. And if you miss it by a foot, you might as well have missed it by a mile. They couldn't see their own hypocrisy. They couldn't see their true condition because they chose to ignore Jesus. The religious leaders, they didn't desire personal holiness. All they wanted was public recognition. That's why they wore special garments and they expected special titles and greetings and they looked for the special seats in all of the public gatherings. Why? Because it was all about drawing attention to them when it is our job, our mission, our calling as it was theirs to bring all the attention and glory and praise to God alone. Wearsby writes this. Warren Wearsby says there's two tragedies here. First... 
Their deliberate hypocrisy was only a cover-up that enabled them to fool and exploit people. That's the first tragedy here. It was all a show. Of all rackets that are out there, religious rackets are the worst. They are the worst. Because they claim and they lie, they give people a false sense of assurance and hope, when in reality, the only hope is not found in any religious practice, it's found in relationship with Jesus, and when we have a right relationship with Jesus, we will walk and model and display real religion before the world. Amen. The religious leaders had turned the temple of God into a den of thieves and religious devotion into play acting. That's what that word hypocrite, when Jesus says, beware the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, the word hypocrite meant play actor. It was someone who put on a mask and a costume and acted out a show, and then when they got off the stage, they took it off. And many of us do this every Sunday. You put on your religious game face, you come in, you go through the motions, and then as soon as you are back in the privacy of your own home, what happens then? Because it's what we do in secret that reveals who we truly are and what we truly worship. That's tragedy number one. The general public actually thought these leaders were godly men when in reality... They were defiling and destroying souls, Jesus said in Matthew 23. Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes, he said, you will travel all the way across the world just to make one convert, and all you do is make him a double son of hell. What a warning for us church leaders today, amen? amen. If people walk away from Antioch Baptist Church with anything but Jesus, we have failed. We have failed. If they walk away just... Oh, yeah, I mean, the fellowship is great, and the music is great, and all the teaching is great, all of it is great, but if we do not connect with the living God, we have missed the boat, and we're up a creek without a paddle. Not going to make another movie joke. I'm just going to keep going. Second tragedy. They rejected their own Messiah, and they voted to crucify him. These guys had read the book of Malachi. They had read the prophet Isaiah. They had read the prophet Jeremiah. They had read the prophet Daniel. They knew, they, had, they knew what the promises were. But they rejected Christ and crucified him. They led the nation into ruin because they would not admit their sins and confess Jesus Christ. These were experts in the Bible. But the problem was they did not apply the truth to their own lives. And until you apply it to you, it's not going to have its desired effect. Oh, we love to apply it to everybody else, don't we? That's right. And we like to defend ourselves with it. Oh, man, somebody will throw Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 out there quick. Oh, judge not, judge not, judge not, right? But have you really let the word examine you so that you can get the plank out of your own eye? Because you need the mirror of the word of God to see it because you don't know what you look like. Did you know that? Amen. Right. It's interesting because we really and truly have no idea without the help of a mirror what we actually look like. You ever walked around with your fly down? You ever walked around with a big piece of spinach in your teeth and you're smiling and greeting and everybody's like, yeah, hi, how are you? And you're like, you're like, what is something, you know, what's going on? You know, and then you look in the mirror and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. We don't know what we look like and you really don't know what you sound like. Did you know that you sound differently to everybody else than you do to yourself? You ever listen to a recording of your own voice and you're like, who the heck is this? We need the Holy Spirit to reveal our true condition to us. Amen. And I think God designed the physical body to, to illustrate that to us. We don't know. Amen. And that's what deception is. It's when you think you are right, but in all actuality, you couldn't be more wrong. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, in a parallel passage after this interaction... He uttered another lamentation over the blind unbelief of the nation and their unwillingness to trust him. He'd given them so many opportunities, but they wasted them. Now it was too late. And Jesus says something that is just chilling to me. He says at the end of verse 47 of chapter 20, these will receive greater punishment. Spider-Man's uncle told him this, with great power comes great responsibility. Jesus is telling this, telling us this this morning. With great knowledge, there is greater accountability. You know the Bible frontwards and backwards. You had better follow it. 
There is a greater judgment and punishment for those who know what they should do, but then they turn around and they don't do it. There is a less severe punishment. I don't know how it works. I, I, I don't know how the end time judgment, I don't know, I don't know exactly, none of us know exactly how it will play out. But one thing is very clear from the teachings of Jesus. Those who know better should do better. Amen. 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 To whom much is given, Jesus said it in another way. To whom much is given, much is required. We can go to 7-Eleven and Walmart and buy 10 cases of Bibles. You can walk out with a Slurpee and a New King James, 7-Eleven. And there's a billion people all over the world have zero access to the gospel. And we think, oh, that's okay. I, I, I know the tone. I know the, I, know, I know the right way. I know the right, I know the right look. I got it all together. I don't, listen, you need to be challenged and convicted and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guard your heart, Proverbs 4, because all of life flows from right here lesson number two is give it all give it all nothing reveals the true condition of our hearts like our giving jesus taught this so well and so often he said wherever your treasure is that's where your heart is billy graham said it this way if you want to know what people are truly serving look at their day timer and their checkbook now, in today's language, mo most of us don't have a day timer, and most of us don't keep a checkbook anymore. You want to know? Look at your banking app and your calendar on your phone. And good Lord, you will be in good shape if that's all you're looking at on your phone. Amen? Amen. Amen. It reveals our hearts. Jesus ends his teaching, and then he turns his attention to the temple treasury, and he's seeing all the rich people come. And I'm sure his disciples are really impressed because there's these rich people who are, they're giving extravagant, they're giving huge amounts into the treasury. And they're amazed by it. And, and, and his disciples were likely looking and thinking, wow, they were probably really impressed with their generosity because it was numerically great. But Jesus looked past all of those rich people who were giving, and he saw one poor little widow, and he said something that probably shocked his disciples and everyone who heard him. He said, that woman right there who gave the two little coins, she has given more than everyone else because they gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty. Amen. Amen. A widow who only gave two small coins. Jesus said that this woman was the one who gave more than anyone else. And here's the truth. The reality is, when it comes to giving, many times it's not about the amount that is given. It's about the amount that is withheld. It's not about what we put in. Many times it's about what we are holding back. If you don't believe me, go read Acts chapter 5 and read a story about Ananias and Sapphira. Two people walked up in the church. Barnabas had just given this huge gift, and he laid it all at the apostles' feet. Church is rejoicing. I'm sure he was getting, oh, man, lots of pat. And they said, hey, you know what? We can do the same thing. But the problem was the motive was wrong. See, they wanted to be recognized. They wanted to have that same recognition. And so they said, oh, we have given the full amount, but they had withheld some. And I, I believe that, that they probably gave most of it. But they withheld some in their heart. And Peter looks at him and says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And Ananias drops dead in the middle of the church. Anybody glad for the mercy of God this morning? When you kept that 20 in your wallet this morning, the Holy Spirit didn't strike you dead. You know why? Because you didn't lie about it. It was about the lie. It was about the motive. It was about they wanted to get that recognition from people instead of just being real and honest with God. If they just would have said, this is the amount that we are given and been totally honest and totally upfront, everybody could have celebrated and gone on about their day. But both of them had to die. You know why? Because they lied to God. God don't like a liar. God hates a liar. But he hates lying, I should say. They said, oh, we've given all this when they actually hadn't. And they dropped dead. My question is, and thank God all of us are going to leave this building alive this morning, first of all. Praise God for that. We don't want nobody to die, okay? The point is, is it's not about the number. We had a goal for 250 hope boxes, but if 205 is the best we can do and we did that with a joyful heart, praise God that we did that. It's about the condition of the heart. People get uncomfortable and upset when we talk about money in church. You know, Jesus talks so much about money in the Gospels because of the direct connection 
to our deepest desires. Our deepest desires reveal, our longings reveal who our Lord is. Your longings reveal your Lord. We have to ask ourselves, are we truly giving our all to Jesus, or is he just getting our leftover? Because God wants your first fruits. The first fruits of the offering, God wants your first, and he wants your best. And when you return now, you're not giving it. Remember, we're returning. When we return our first and our best, he blesses the rest. You see how that rhymes? When you give your first and your best, God blesses the rest. You can do more, God can do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. Every time. God's math does not make sense, but it works every single time. And this widow gave it all. She gave two mites, two coins, the lowest available currency. It was about 164th of a denarius, which was a denarius was a day's wage. So if you compared that today to 164th of the average daily wage in the United States, she had two dollars to her name, two bucks, while others are giving thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions. We don't know. They were giving extravagant amounts. She had two bucks left, and she gave it all. You know, we've been teaching, we've been teaching Ezra about money this week. He had some extra time home from school, and then we had a tragedy in the family. We've been traveling, so we're trying to teach him when he's not there, and We've been teaching them about money. And so you break down, the, you start with the coins. When you teach a child about money, you don't start with a $100 bill. You start with the coins. You start with the pennies and the nickels and the dimes and the quarters, right? And so then, so we're teaching them about it. And if you really want to laugh, ask him who's on the quarter because, man, he really butchers George Washington's name. He just cannot get it out, right? And he's a little confused about who Thomas Jefferson is anyway. But it's fun. And he's learning. And so comparatively, you know, we get the dollar. We moved on to the bills. And we had $1 on the bed and then... Of course, 100 pennies, and then 20 nickels, and then 10. I had to look up how many nickels were in a dollar, which is embarrassing. But <laughs> I just, to be honest, I had to look it up because I wanted to be sure. You know, you want to teach them right. Amen. And so you got 100 pennies, and you got 20 nickels, and you had 10 dimes, and four quarters, of course. And it's like all of these different amounts equal a dollar. And then I gave him the dollar, and I said, here, have a dollar because Daddy loves you. You know what he did? He took that dollar, and he went, ooh, my money. And he turned away, and he walked right out of the room. Ooh, my money. He doesn't have any. He's just happy to have it. You know what was funny to me was how quickly he forgot about the gift and took the money as his. Totally forgot about the generosity in an instant. It was like as soon as it got in his hands, what did you say? Ooh, my money. You know, it's funny because we do the same exact thing. God has given us every cent that we have. It is the Lord who gives you the power to obtain wealth. And how quickly we go from acknowledging that it has come from him, every good and perfect gift, and we say, ooh, my money. You had better acknowledge the Lord who gave it to you. Because God wants our hearts. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't necessarily want our money. What does he want? He wants the heart. So often we forget the fact God gave it all to us to begin with. But this widow did not forget. See, her giving reveals her faith. You know, nothing truly measures how accurately you trust God better than how you give. Nothing, no, there's no better test. How are you giving? Are you giving cheerfully, willingly, and are you returning God what he asks you to return to him? If you are doing that with a cheerful and grateful heart, you're in good shape this morning. But God does require us to give our all. Jesus looked past all those big donors and he focuses on the most insignificant person in the bunch. Why? Because her gift demonstrated the greatest sacrifice. It's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. It's about what can I give? It will be different for everyone. Your all will look differently than somebody else's. The question is, are you giving all that you can give? And if we know that we're not, then we need to repent and we need to give because we're required to be good stewards of God's money. And God will give an account for each of us of how we handled our time, our talent, and our treasure. Her submission was the exact thing that the elders, the scribes, and the Pharisees lacked. Her surrender modeled the exact type of surrender that Jesus would model at the end of the week. She gave it all, guess what? 
Jesus gave it all. And Jesus saw her gift, and he makes an instant connection. And he says, she's given more than everybody else. She modeled exactly what Jesus would give. The widow gave it all. Jesus gave it all. The question for us is, will we give it all? Point number three, we need to get it right. As the disciples are marveling at the beauty of the temple, and they're looking at all the, all the beauty, all the things that have been dedicated, all the gifts that had been given, all the, the statues and the, and, the, and the beautiful stone. I mean, Herod's temple was truly a beautiful, magnificent building. And they're marveling. And Jesus, once again, he, he says, don't you understand again? He says, there is not a single one of these stones that will remain on top of the other one. Jesus warns them again about the destruction that was coming. And then he goes into his teaching on the end times, the, 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 the Olivet Discourse. We're going to cover that this Wednesday night. But I'm going to ask the worship team to come this morning, and I want to remind us. Just as they were looking at all the beautiful things around them, Jesus was trying to get their minds back on eternity. And I have to remind us this morning as we're sitting in church, in, in the house of the Lord, singing the songs of our God, hearing the word of God. We cannot get distracted by all the beautiful things around us. Jesus is coming soon, and we have got to be ready. We've got to repent and prepare the way, and we have to tell others to repent and turn their hearts to Jesus. It is time to get it right this morning. We can't let anything distract us from the fact we have an obligation to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, and we have an obligation to prepare the way for Christ. We have got to get it right. It is so important this morning. The religious leaders got it all wrong. Their motives were wrong. Their focus was wrong. Their giving was wrong. Everything that they were doing was wrong. We have the opportunity this morning to get it right before God. And we need to take the time to do that. We can't be focused on the outward, on the material, and on the praise and acceptance of people. Where is your focus right now? Is it on the things of God? Are you focused on doing all that you can do for the kingdom of God? Somebody this morning needs to get it right with Jesus. You have put it off for long enough. Today is the day. Now is the time. This part of the service is where we say, Lord, search me and know me. Examine my heart and, and tell me if there's any unclean way in me. And we get it right with God right now. This is your part between you and God as we sing about his love. What do you need to get right with the Lord this morning? Is it something that's gotten in your heart, something that's stealing your affection? Have you been robbing God? I mean, have you been withholding from Him? Do you have your, your mind and your heart in all the wrong places and you've just spent this week and you've just missed it and you've missed it? Oh, I'm going to remind you this morning, our Lord is gracious and compassionate, full of loving kindness and mercy. And now is the time where we can pour our hearts out before Him and He can restore us and fill us again with His Spirit. Don't miss your time to get it right. One of the great preachers, uh, his name was F.B. Meyer, and he, he asked D.L. Moody, who was one of the most famous evangelists that ever lived and ever preached, and he asked D.L. Moody, he said, why is your preaching so effective with the lost? Because D.L. Moody, he would preach and hundreds and thousands of people would get saved everywhere. And D.L. Moody looked at him and he said this, he says, I preach with the full knowledge that Jesus might return before my sermon is over. And that's what he said was the difference. You know, Jesus might return before we get out of church, before you have an opportunity to start your car and go back to your home. Do not wait, do not delay. Get your heart right with Jesus now. He is just as close as your next prayer. And all you have to do is call on his name. And whatever you specifically need, the Lord will specifically supply this morning. One last story before we respond to the Lord. There was a mother, a mom, a wife who had lost her husband and she had a small daughter who was left and the mom's trying to explain to the daughter what had happened to her daddy. And so the mother looks at her little girl and, and she says, well, God sent for, for daddy and God took daddy to be home with him. And one day God is going to take us all home to be with him. The, the thing is, is honey, we just never know when God's going to call us home. And the little girl looked at her mother and she said, Mommy, 
If we don't know when God's going to call us home, shouldn't we go home and pack a bag so that we're ready? There's some people listening to the sound of my voice. It's time to get your heart ready. Because you don't know. You could go to a routine doctor's appointment tomorrow and your whole life can go from here to here. You don't know what could happen. You could be at an intersection and somebody runs a red light. We don't know. Now is the time to get it right with Jesus. Amen. Let's have him examine and guard our hearts. Let's give our all to him. And let's take this moment to make sure we're right. Let's stand together and sing. Respond to the Lord as you feel led.
down, buy you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. overwhelming love that chases us down that won't give up on us amen hey let's take the let's take time today and every day as we go to Sunday school as we continue come back tonight as we go about our way let, let's make sure that we guard our heart so that no bit of re religious religious fakeness or worldliness can get in and and spoil a pure desire to love and please the Lord amen Let's love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Amen. Lord, I just thank you for your mercy and your love. I thank you for calling us to yourself. I'm thankful, oh God, that we have your word so that we can know. You've given us the mirror of your word so that we can let you examine us. Lord, every single one of us in this place, Lord, we walked in with all kinds of struggles and heartaches. And Lord, our minds are, are, are assaulted with so many distractions. Lord, we just pray that we will hear you speaking to our hearts because your desire is for us. Your desire is for us to walk in the purity of the joy of knowing you, to live in your love and to show it to the world. Help us, oh God, to guard our hearts, to give our all and help us to get it right with you so that we can do all that you've called us to do and we can be everything you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. If you're new, stop into the kitchen and see us.